It is about an aspect of, of heaven that I believe that is really at the heart of the matter. Because at the end of the day, there are, of course, things that we anticipate about heaven. Maybe if you've got sickness in your body, you're looking forward to a day when there is no sickness. Maybe if you're going through a time of sorrow, you anticipate when God will wipe away all tears and there will be no sorrow. Uh, those of you that are broke are looking forward maybe to having a, a nice mansion that has no mortgage or rent attached to it. And uh, you're looking for that day of stability. But yes. I believe that at the heart of all of the other wonders that are a part of the eternal heaven, the joy of exploring, exploring and knowledge and all of those things is an innate desire of us as God's creation to be able to be with God, uh, to be able to be with yes. him without hindrance, without walls, without separation, uh, to be able to look upon his face. And there is a, a hymn that we sing that says, oh, I want to see him, uh, to look upon his yes. face, uh, there to sing forever of his saving grace. Uh, on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice, cares are past, home at last ever to rejoice. That opening line really captures the heart of what I want to talk to you about here today. That longing. Oh, I want to see yes. him to look upon his face. Amen. And so today we're going to go to God's word in Psalm 63 and verse one. It captures the cry of the psalmist David saying, oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirst for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. We see many other such sentiments from David where he, he talks in other passages as, as the deer pants after the water brook. Uh, so pants my soul after you, O oh God. Uh, there is a longing that is there in David's heart to be present with the Lord, to look upon his face. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last chapter that we have written from the Apostle Paul. Not long after, he would be martyred according to history. And he said in 2 Timothy 4 and 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You want to know those who are going to make it to heaven? It is those who are longing for his appearing, that care enough uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are making plans uh, and they are making actions uh, that lead towards that destination because there is anticipation. Uh, and that song, Oh, I Want to See Him, captures the longing of the human heart that stretches across the ages. The longing to see an invisible God. You know, made in, in ancient history, it made the, the worship of Yahweh unique because every other God, every other deity that man imagined, uh, they always had a physical representation. Uh, idols that showed their God, maybe in the form of a, an animal or a, you know, a giant person or some hybrid of the two, but some visual representation. But Yahweh said, uh, don't make any graven image. Uh, don't make any representation of me. You're not going to replace me uh, with some object, but turn your attention uh, to me. But the challenge is, is that we are visual creatures uh, and we are physical creatures and we have a longing uh, to see an invisible God, to be close to him, to look upon his face. I have been uh, working on a, a mental exercise as I have been dealing with challenges that have come as a part of this building project and reminding myself of the gospel account of the day that Jesus came walking on the water. And when Peter called out and says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out of the boat and did what no other mortal human had ever done. And that is he began to walk upon the storm-tossed waves. But there came this moment where his focus slipped. And instead of looking at Jesus, he began to look at the storm. And it's like it sunk in. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. I'm out here standing on the top of water in the midst of a, a storm that could kill me. And in that moment, fear replaced faith. And he began to sink and cried out to Jesus. 
And so I have been working at the mental exercise of when I feel my focus is shifting to the storm uh, to try to intentionally uh, shift my eyes, my right. mental vision yes. uh, back onto Jesus and realize uh, that he's the one that matters. Uh, but it real, I realized the other day as I was actually doing that mental exercise of uh, trying to focus on Jesus, uh, I experienced this frustration. And it was a frustration that came uh, because as I mentally tried to visualize Jesus, uh, it was hard for me to come up uh, with a vision of Jesus that was not tainted by uh, all of the uh, Renaissance depiction of Jesus, uh, you know, with uh, which I know to be inaccurate. And so it's this, you know, mental cognitive dissonance that I'm experiencing because I know uh, Jesus was not a hippie, uh, you know, that looked uh, blonde haired and blue dyed hippie. Uh, that was not who Jesus Jesus was, but all of the pictures you see of Jesus are influenced by that. And I was trying to get a proper mental image and I was struggling to do it. And so it's in that moment that I realized that even in a day when God has become incarnate, for those of us, we've never been able to walk and talk with Jesus. It's not just the, you know, eternal longing to see an invisible God. It's even the longing to see Jesus. And look upon his face. And Paul wrote that Jesus is coming to reward those who have loved his appearing. I believe that there needs to be a longing in our heart that says in desperation, oh, I want to see him. Not to just get out of the present circumstance, not to escape a dying and corrupted world, but a longing for him to be with him. It would be easy to argue as we look at Job that Job's situation was unfair. We have the privilege, of course, as we read the biblical account, that we can see that this situation had nothing to do with God punishing Job or some failure on Job's part. In fact, God is singling Job out because he's exceptional, because he has a perfect and an upright walk with God. And we know that this was really not about God chastising Job, but rather it was God proving a point to Satan. Satan thinking that everyone was as corrupted as what he was, that everyone is as, as shallow in their motives as what he was. And God wanted to demonstrate that you could strip away all the superficial blessings Blessings, uh, the financial blessings, even the blessings of the health and, uh, and uh, earthly happiness. Uh, and that there would still be a faithfulness and a devotion and a love for God uh, behind all of those things. And Satan didn't believe it. So we know that this was not about God punishing Job, but rather about God uh, believing in Job enough to allow him to go through that journey. But remember this, Job did not have that same privilege. It's not like God sat down with Job and says, all right, buddy, things are about to get rough. But this is only happening because I believe in you, because uh, you have such a great relationship with me that it's going to weather the storm. No, all Job had to go on was the evidence going on around him, wherein one fell swoop after another. Uh, he lost all of his wealth. Uh, he then lost all of his children. Uh, then he lost his health. Uh, and then his marriage was on the rocks. Uh, and then eventually his friend show up. Now, Job was initially able to absorb the impact of calamity and to maintain his integrity. Even in the face of great loss, he kept his trust and his faith in God. Uh, but then the constant barrage of criticism and attacks from his so-called friends war and war and war at him. See, they only had one prevailing theme. They were like an instrument with only one note. And that theme was, all of this is happening because of your sin. You have obviously done something to deserve this. And you need to just be honest and confess what it is that you've done. God wouldn't do this to you if you didn't deserve it. And their mind and their philosophy and their religiosity, that's the only thing, thing that made sense. And by the way, you need to be careful when you start to try to make God conform to your own preset ideas. It always ends in trouble. Uh, when you don't let God instruct you. And you try to put God in a box. Uh, that your religion and your limited ideas have created. 
Now, Job knows that these accusations are untrue and they are unfair. And so he tries to fight back. He tries first uh, in defending himself. And he does this again and again. And they just keep coming at him. Uh, and so uh, in the process, though, where he, he's trying to defend himself, uh, he eventually crosses a line. And uh, he essentially uh, concludes that if this isn't his fault, uh, then it must in some way be evidence of God's injustice, uh, that God is being unfair and he longs for a face-to-face -face encounter with God a chance to plead his case and he said in Job 23 and 3 oh that I knew where I might find him that I might come to his seat I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And so his conundrum is, is that I want direct access to God. I want to get to God. And, and all of this, I'm trying to perceive God at work. And I just, I can't find him. I can't understand. I can't perceive how God could be in any of this. Right. And by the way, we know that he was wrong. God was in this. And God was with him. And God was not ignoring him. But as time passes, Job clearly comes to grips with the fact that he may not survive his sickness, this calamity that has come upon him. He no longer sees the light at the end of the tunnel. And he begins to powerfully instead express his hopes to see God for himself on the other side of the resurrection. Life had stopped making sense in the here and now. But he knew that when he was in God's presence, uh, everything would make sense once again. And he said, for I know, uh, Job 19.25, for I know uh, that my Redeemer lives. Uh, and he shall stand at last on the earth. Uh, and after my sin is, skin is destroyed, this I know, uh, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within him. You see, there was this longing in Job's heart, an instinct that told him that even though this life was unfair, that when he was in his God's presence, when the Redeemer, talking about the Messiah, had come to earth, that things would be set right. And he recognized, as he longed for heaven, on the other side of the resurrection, he says, I'm going to see God, not in some remote spiritual sense, uh, not in some uh, religious fantasy, uh, but I am going to see him in my flesh uh, with my own eyes. Uh, and when I see him, uh, I know, I know that things will make sense then. Now that day for Job has not yet come, but we do know that he did have an experience in his life where God came to speak directly to him. In the manifestation of a divine whirlwind. And God, of course, challenged Job and uh, his false assumptions. And he began to reveal aspects of his majesty and greatness. And uh, he was blowing Job's mind, expanding it uh, with a realization of just how big uh, and how great God really was. Uh, and by the time he got done revealing his majesty, this was Job's response towards the end of the book, Job 42 and 5. I have heard of you. By the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent uh, in dust and ashes. Uh, when Job had an encounter with God, uh, he was no longer interested in defending himself uh, or saying that I'm good uh, and everything is all right. Uh, but rather when he encountered God uh, and really encountered him, uh, his number one in instinct was to fall down uh, and to repent. Uh, because he recognized uh, whatever righteousness I have had uh, is nothing compared to his majesty. Uh, 
And let me say this morning, uh, when you really come into an encounter with God, uh, you lose interest uh, in trying to defend your choices uh, and the actions that you have made. Uh, and when you really uh, experience his majesty, uh, all you want to do is say, God, uh, forgive me for being a sinner. Uh, and please uh, save me. Uh, love me. Uh, come into my life. Uh, I must know I must have you. You see, Job was right in his prediction. Even in this life, in this limited encounter, everything changed when he saw God. The final chapter of Job's life, as we read it, is God setting things right and blessing Job for enduring the trial. But I do want to point out that Job didn't really see God. He says, I've now seen you with my eyes, but he didn't really see God. He saw a manifestation of God in a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And even that experience, that limited revelation of God's essence was overwhelming for Job. He felt overwhelmed and crushed by God's majesty, even in that filter, filtered form, falling, uh, he says, in repentance, in dust and ashes before the greatness of God. We see another such encounter a little bit later on when Moses came into a place where in the wilderness, having already led the Israelites in the Exodus out of Egypt, he had already begun to develop a greater intimacy with God than just about anyone before and maybe few since. God called him a personal friend. And the final word on Moses at the end of the Deuteronomy says this, says in Deuteronomy 34 and 10, but since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So the Bible says that God knew Moses face to face. That's speaking about relationship, a true relationship of friends, not the posture of a supplicant looking up to God, but rather a face to face conversation, a, a, a commune of friends. And yet later on, Moses would say, I want to see your glory. I want to see more of you. And God says to him in Exodus 33 and 17, I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the Lord, the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses was desperate to see God in his glory. To build upon the relationship that he already had. To know more of him. To capture more of the mystery of God's essence. But God told Moses, you don't know what you're asking for. Yeah. You can't see my face. Why? Because no one can see me and live. You would not survive the encounter, Moses, if you looked upon my unfiltered glory. The unholiness of man. Would simply be destroyed by the utter holiness of God. We sang already today, you are holy. Oh, so holy. The angels continually cry that God is holy in a continual round of praise. It is his single most defining aspect and attribute. God, above all else, is holy. Holy in the sense of uniqueness. Holy in the sense of purity. Holy in the sense of righteousness. There is no one like him. And fallen man in our sinful condition is simply incompatible uh, with the holiness of God. Uh, we talked about it a few weeks ago in our Tuesday night lesson, uh, lessons from Lazarus and how that there the Lazarus went to a place called Abraham's bosom uh, because until the finished work of Calvary, uh, it was impossible uh, for man's sin to be dealt with adequately. Uh, that there was until the sacrifice was made. Uh, the book of Hebrews says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats uh, to take away sin. Uh, it required the sinless Son of God, God manifest in flesh, to make Himself 
a substitutional sacrifice for us to atone for our sin. So Moses, even though he was a righteous man and a friend of God, he would be destroyed by the holiness of God. So God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and he passed by, allowing Moses essentially to see the afterglow of his presence. But even that experience, that limited access, uh, was so profound that 40 days later, when Moses came down off the mountain, uh, the reflected glory of God shone so brightly on his face uh, that the people couldn't stand to look at him. Uh, even looking at Moses was too blinding for them. Uh, because even after 40 days, uh, the glory of God was still uh, reflecting off of him. And he had to veil his face before he could talk to them. Well, if that Moses saw just the afterglow of God walking by, uh, and over a month later, uh, people couldn't bear to look at Moses, yeah. right. it gives you a little bit of a sense of how profound the presence of God is. And even Moses had not really seen God and looked upon his face in the way that the song that we sing longs for in fact, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6 and 16 about God who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be glory and everlasting power. Amen. The immortal God dwells in an unapproachable light, a glory and a holiness so intense, so bright, that no man can approach him. And here... Paul says, no man has seen him, nor can see him. And John makes it clear in John 1.18 that these former encounters, be it in a whirlwind or a burning bush, angels of the Lord or other theophanies uh, being hidden in the cleft of the rock when God passes by, they are not the same as seeing God. For John declares definitively uh, in John 1 and 18, uh, no one has seen God. At any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father. He has declared him. So no one at any point really saw God in the sense of seeing God in his unfiltered glory and majesty. But Jesus, the only begotten, has declared him according to John. That word declared uh, means unfolded, uh, revealed, made known, uh, manifested. Uh, and so Jesus revealed God in a human canvas. Uh, but even Jesus' own disciples who spent day after day with him, uh, they experienced the frustration of wanting to see God. They still wanted to see the Father. And so they said in John 14... Jesus talking to them in verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me... Has seen the Father. So how can you say show us the Father? Here Jesus is revealing a profound truth. Uh, and that is that Jesus is not uh, the physical manifestation uh, of a second person, the divine son. Uh, but he's saying I am the manifestation of the Father. Uh, I am the Father revealed. And if you have seen me, uh, you have seen uh, the Father. Uh, I am the face of God revealed. But even here, there's something more. You see, Jesus is the physical manifestation of God. But while he was here on earth, his emphasis was on humanity. He most often referred to himself as the son of man, not the son of God. He didn't walk around looking like a Greek demigod, glowing with godly power and rippling muscles. <laughs> making the women swoon. He looked like an ordinary man. Except for one time. In Matthew 17, the Bible says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, 
led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. See what Peter, James, and John saw in this moment of transfiguration, where the, uh, the, the veil of the humanity was allowed to slip back to allow the deity to shine through. But what they saw in this moment was so profound, so overwhelming, that they fell on their faces. And the Bible says they were greatly afraid. They had been walking and talking with Jesus for years. But what they saw in that moment freaked them out so much that they were on the ground petrified in fear. Because this was not the Jesus for whom they were familiar with. The one that seemed so comforting and so close. This was something alien and profound and great and vast and it scared them to death. It would not have been comfortable for them to dwell there for a long time with Jesus in his transfigured form. They couldn't handle it. It was just a few minutes and then it was over. The Bible says looking at Jesus was like looking at the sun. I don't know if you've ever tried to stare at the sun. I don't recommend that you do it. Because it's not very good for your eyes. But trying to look at Jesus was like looking at the intensity of the noonday sun. It was utterly dazzling and blinding and overwhelming. You could not comfortably look at him. And so they had to look away because it was so bright, so overwhelming. Jesus essentially turned off the filter of humanity for a little while. To allow the glory to be revealed. And commentator David Guzik says. Essentially this was not a new miracle. But the temporary cessation of an ongoing one. The real miracle was that Jesus most of the time. Could keep from displaying this glory. Now John of these three. He is unique in having had a second similar experience. In the book of Revelation. Where he sees Jesus in his glory. And he says in Revelation 1 and 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and head hair were white like wool, uh, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, uh, and his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, uh, and his voice as as the sound of many waters. Uh, he had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, uh, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And look at his response. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. It laid me out completely. I could not handle seeing what I saw. It struck me to the ground as dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. Remember, this is John the beloved, the one that laid his head over on Jesus at the last supper, the one so close, so familiar with him. But when he saw Jesus in his unfiltered majesty, yeah. he says, I dropped down like dead yeah. at the sight. So ladies and gentlemen, this is clearly not the solution. We have God manifest in flesh. That's huge. But even God's manifestation in human form is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yet Jesus, as John saw him, is the resurrected Savior. God manifests in flesh. He goes on to say just after this, he says, I am he who am alive, was dead, and am alive for evermore. So we know that this is Jesus whom John is talking about. He saw God manifest in the flesh, the permanent self-revelation of God. How God will eternally reveal himself. And I'll tell you how I know that in just a moment. But this would not satisfy the longings we see in scripture. Of those who desperately wanted to see God, to come close to him, to talk to him like a friend or to plead their case directly. If you can't even handle the sight without dropping like dead, yeah. it's going to be hard to have an intimate relationship with him. The Bible calls Jesus the bridegroom and us the bride. But 
I don't know about how your marriage goes, but when I walk in the room, my wife's able to stay on her feet. I don't have to go over and put a hand on her shoulder and say, do not be afraid, honey. And I have to confess that even at my best day, I've still never had that effect on her or any other person. So clearly, Jesus, he is God manifest in flesh. He has already condescended from the form that of the invisible, ever-present, omnipotent God who fills the universe already. It was a great sacrifice for him to assume this more lowly form. Right. And yet even then, God is too great yeah. for us. So if the final change will not come from God and his existence, then the final change must happen in us. Right. Yes. Yes. The book of Hebrews says... Hebrews 12 and 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You're never going to look at this scripture quite the same after this message here today, because what we have seen to this moment is that even in God manifest in flesh, even in Jesus Christ, uh, his holiness is so profound. Uh, you look upon him and you fall down like dead. Uh, you are overwhelmed by the brightness of his person. Uh, and so uh, the book writer of Hebrews reveals this, uh, that unless there is a pursuit of holiness, uh, there's something that's got to happen in us uh, because God has already made his change. Uh, God has already made his transformation. Uh, and so there is something that's got to be changed and got to be transformed in me because without holiness no one will see the Lord the final piece of this puzzle uh, is a change in us, uh, a perfecting of holiness, uh, a transformation in this mortal body uh, where sin no longer makes us hide from God uh, like Adam did after his sin. Uh, a transformation from this fallen state uh, where God's holiness uh, ceases to be overwhelming uh, and instead feels like home uh, to where you come close uh, to the blinding light of his glory uh, and instead of feeling overwhelmed and shrinking back. There is a desire to embrace and to be wrapped in the light of his glory in the light of his holiness. We don't get there now in this life. But we start the journey. We pursue holiness, Scripture says. It becomes a pursuit, a passion, an obsession inside of us. I tell you that people that are constantly fixed on the idea of, is it a heaven or hell issue? Can I get away with this and still go to heaven? They are not pursuing holiness. Holiness and a pursuit of it doesn't put limits and say, God, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that. God, I'm willing to sacrifice this, but I'm not willing to deal with that. But true holiness and a pursuit says, I want all of God, and I'm willing to reject all of sin in the process. That pursuit is what happens now. Uh, and the perfection is what happens uh, then. Uh, when that work is complete. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 and 51. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. To make it very plain. It says. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. Jesus. It will happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into or immortal bodies. Thus, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, and our mortal bodies have been transformed into immortal bodies, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death. Is swallowed up in victory. Yes. Oh death. 
where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? See, those who pursue God in his holiness Jesus, Jesus. will find a day of final transformation at the resurrection, the rapture of the saints. When our mortal bodies have been transformed and his holiness is perfected in us, God no longer dwells in unapproachable light. But that light becomes approachable. It becomes welcoming. Look to the eternal city. Revelation 21, 23. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. Yeah. The Lamb, Jesus, is its light. That radiance that shone as bright as the sun. Uh, that radiance, uh, that light uh, is what fills the city uh, with the, that light. It's not some artificial light. Uh, it's not LEDs or uh, CFLs, uh, but rather it is the light of the Lamb of God, uh, His glory that fills it. Uh, and rather than falling down as dead uh, because it's overwhelming or saying, uh, it's too bright, uh, put the light away. Uh, instead, we will glory in that light. Uh, we will embrace that light. Uh, it'll be like the day, and I'll be my closest illustration because uh, I haven't been there yet. Uh, it's one of those golden days uh, where you may not look at the sun, but you just want to tilt your face up uh, and let that light hit your face. Uh, and there is this feeling uh, of goodness and happiness that comes over uh, as you bask in the light of the sun. Uh, well, imagine that a million times over uh, as we bask in the light uh, of the Son of God uh, in His presence. Uh, that glory that fills all. And while before no one could see God, no one could see his face and live in heaven, all of that has changed. And there shall be no curse, Revelation 22 and 3 says, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face yes. and his name shall be on their foreheads. We're going to see his face. Music, you can come back. Not just because he manifested himself in the flesh. That is the huge part of the equation here. And I, in no way am I trying to diminish the incarnation. Right. The fact that God came as a man and maintains a human identity. But it's not just that. That is only one part of the puzzle. God condescended to come to us. But in the final analysis, the reason why we can bear to be with him is because he has also elevated us. It's not that God came all the way down to the lowest of the low. It's not that we have risen to God's level. But rather, as Paul wrote, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. James says, draw near unto God. And he'll draw near unto you. You see, God meets us in the middle. He brought himself down a little bit lower. But most importantly, the Bible says he raises us up to heavenly places. He elevates us. Here's Satan's lie to you today, church. Satan's lie is that the best pleasures you can ever know are to be found right here, right now. In sin and on this earth. But God's truth says this. You can't even begin to imagine the pleasures that I have for you. You don't even have the body yet to fully appreciate all I have planned for you. You see, Satan's pleasures. Here's the dark underbelly. Everything that Satan offers. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. But the dark underbelly is that it doesn't exalt you. It degrades you. People pursue sexual pleasures and they feel cheap and used afterward. They seek a high in substances and there's the inevitable crash afterward where the darkness comes back and the self-loathing falls over them. All the things that Satan offers, they give you a little temporary spike and then it sucks you down and makes you less than what you were before you started. But God's plan 
is not to degrade you. It's to exalt you. We will not spend eternity with a distant, unknowable, overwhelming God, but with a bridegroom who is close and intimate, knowable, relatable, but oh so wonderful. We want to see him. That longing that we all feel for things to make sense. To be loved. To have a life that has meaning and purpose. All of those things will be fulfilled beyond our imaginations in heaven. But what I want to say to you today as we prepare to respond to God's word. Is that this is not all future tense. But rather that the journey to heaven starts right now. The journey to that perfected holiness starts with the pursuit of holiness in the here and now. It begins with salvation, with rejecting unholiness and sin. Today, Deb is taking a step in that journey, saying uh, goodbye to an old life and burying it in baptism. Because there's a better life ahead. There's a better path ahead. She's discovered a better way. There is a path of holiness that is better than the degrading of sin. And the Bible says that those who pursue holiness are going to see the Lord. And oh, I want to see him. To look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace there's a burning in my heart a desire to see him and i believe that that same flame is burning in the hearts of others uh, maybe you've been serving god for decades or maybe you're right at the cusp of beginning your journey with god but wherever you are today god loves you and he desires you and he's calling you to holiness will you stand with me right now I want to invite you to respond. If there is a burning passion in your heart, maybe you're just coming to get a glimpse of the Savior, but already there's something in you that says, I want to see him. I want to see him. Well, you're the one whom God is reaching for today. I want to invite you to come and to respond, to reach out to God and say, Lord, I want to see you. Lord, I want to be holy. I want to look on your face.